Greetings to everybody on this first Sunday in Advent here at St. Matthew's Church in Glendale, California. We're glad to have you with us as we continue our study of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be starting into chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians today. But today is the first Sunday of Advent, first Sunday of the new church year. And some of you may have seen this, but I'm guessing that most have not. CNN did a really nice article today online on Advent and where it comes from and what it means. And so I thought I'd start today by reading, I'll skip through it a little bit, but this article, thanks to CNN, will take excerpts to talk about what is really Advent and what traditions might we find. Wreaths, candles, and calendars. These are sure signs of Advent for many Christian denominations around the world. But what does Advent mean exactly? The word Advent derives from the Latin Adventus, which means an arrival or visit. If you were in St. Matthew's worship this morning, I mentioned that. It's the arrival. Advent is the beginning of the spiritual year for many churches, and it's observed the four Sundays before Christmas Day. Spiritually, it is meant as a celebration of the earthly birth of Jesus around 2,000 years ago, but also, and this often gets forgotten, it is also meant as a preparation and anticipation for the return of Jesus at the end of time. In 2022, Advent starts today. Each Sunday in some traditions has a different spiritual theme, and it often involves the ceremonial lighting of an Advent candle. As with many aspects of any religion, Advent customs and practices vary from place to place. Here are some Advent and general Christmas traditions in various countries around the world. We're also including possible houses of worship in case you have to be, happen to be traveling. First one they list is Austria, and Austria is most known as far as Christmas traditions for its beloved Christmas hymn, which is... Silent Night. Silent Night comes to us from Austria, still a knocked in German. It was penned during Christmas of 1818. And you may remember, I think it's two or three Christmases ago, Thrive at Financial for Lutherans uh, kind of bankrolled a uh, hour documentary on the history of Silent Night. And I just saw Channel 5 is rerunning that this weekend or this week. So you can It was watch. on last year for one, and I think it's going to be, be rerun again. Yeah. Okay. I just set my DVR to record and then I didn't pay attention to when it was. But yeah. I, wa I, I watched it last night. Oh, so it was on last night on Channel 5? Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So our our version of the hymn differs a little bit from the original German, but it kind of gives us that idea. And CNN mentions, if you're looking for a picturesque place, it's the uh, town of Salzburg, which is famous for? Mozart. 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 <laughs> and anything else you can think of? Castle. Castle. Sing Sound of Music is set there in Salzburg. If you can picture the wedding scene of Maria getting married, that's supposed to be the cathedral. It's actually not. They, they, they did the exteriors in Salzburg. They did the interiors in a different church. But if you can picture the kids running around there, that's the Salzburg Cathedral with that tradition. China, next it says, China might not immediately come to mind when you think of Advent. But roughly 5.1% of the population of 1.4 billion is Christian. So what's 5% of 1.4 billion? It'd be still an awful lot of people. Uh, Chinese Christians light up their homes with colorful paper lanterns during Advent. And you might find red paper pagodas cut out and placed in windows. Many traditions were brought by Western missionaries. An emerging Christmas tradition in Advent is giving apples, which are sold in wrapped in colored uh, paper. One of the main places to worship for our Christmas worship in China is St. Ignatius Cathedral in Shanghai, which was built in 1906, damaged in the Cultural Revolution, but has since been restored. I've been there, uh, and outside there is kind of a huge Christmas market. And if you see all the stuff at Walmart or Kmart or whatever's on the shelves, the stuff that you've bought for decorations in the last few years, of course, it's all made in China pretty much now. And it's that market outside St. Ignatius where uh, merchants like whoever from Walmart goes over to see 
what they're making this year or to ask them to make this or that. And so you can walk through them, see all the stuff that's going to be coming for Christmas the next year. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that, Mike? No, I just said buyers. Buyers, yeah. Yeah, but I got to walk through. I mean, anybody can walk through and look at it, but it's the buyers who they're talking to, obviously. Yeah. Croatia in... Uh, Croatia, about 86% of the people are Roman Catholic, so Advent is very large there. They actually start on St. Catherine's Day, which is November 25th, uh, and they use the Advent wreath. They go to wooden stalls, which sell souvenirs and chestnuts and mulled wine. Uh, Germany, of course, is famous for Advent with Advent wreath with four candles. Families actually tend to have wreaths in their homes and they sing carols at home while lighting the candles. Similar to fruitcake, in Germany they eat stolen, which you can buy at World Market. I remember Andreas bought, brought me some a couple years ago. And what kids love, chocolate advent. Calendars. calendars. Chocolate advent calendars, which I still buy myself one every year. <laughs> Some people never grow up. Right. right. <laughs> Me either. One trade a day. Yeah, it's, you only get one, one a day. And they mentioned in, in uh, Germany, one of the places to worship is Awesome Church in Munich, which I was just at recently. It's just been refurbished. It's, uh, it's this uh, little private Baroque chapel, which was built by two brothers. It's not very large, but it's very ornate. Unfortunately, it's often tied to Hitler because there's a famous picture showing Hitler probably the one time in his life he was ever in a church walking out of the church trying to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Trying to make himself look like he was a Christian. Uh, Hungary does treats and advent calendars with little chocolates also. They celebrate matins, which matins is kind of like morning prayer without Eucharist. Uh, but they also do a daily mass every day during the time uh, with different treats it talks about here. Cathedral in Budapest. Advent in Mexico. Big part of that is Los Posadas, which translates to the yeah, little inns. The little inns, right? And the people remember Mary and Joseph's That's journey there. from December 16th to 24th in cities and villages across Mexico. There's a child dressed up as an angel who leads the processional. They go to selected homes where they're denied entry but often given refreshments. We go to Alvera Street for that. Yeah. Oh, do you? Huh? I did. I did when I was little all the time. We have taken yeah. families with children also, and they sing everything in Spanish. It doesn't matter. You know, you do the best you can, and you go along, and you just... You, you, get, to, you get to music uh, for your translation for your singing, and uh, instead of when they go from stall to stall, the mm -hmm. shopkeeper turn their lights off, like refusing, we have no vacancy. Oh. For for a number of years, we did it here at St. Matthew's when we were trying to get a Spanish service going. We would hire a mariachi band, and uh, Maria Paiva from cool. the Senate office would help. Cool. And it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Well, sometimes you go end, around the neighborhood. And at the end of the procession, you get hot chocolate and pan dulce. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, talks about Poland. In Poland, they do early morning masses, being very Catholic country, before they, they do a daily mass before going before the sun comes up so that the sun comes up during mass to remember the light coming into the world uh, what else there? united kingdom they make chris dingles it started with the moravians in, in 1740s germany uh, chris dangle is an orange which is decorated with a candle and red tape and sweets and often used for fundraisers for children's charities in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, theirs is slightly different. They do a nativity fast to remember what Jesus did for us. And you may have seen in the news that though, uh, though the Ukraine is an Orthodox country, which would tend to make January 6th the big day, they've received a special dispensation this year for many Ukrainians will make December 25th their big day simply because of, well, different issues related to the war, but part of it being the power issues that it might be warmer on December 25th than on January 6th. So in Ukraine this year, many will be celebrating Western uh, Christmas instead of Easter. Just some fun facts about Advent before we get started. Yeah, it's great. Thank you.
No, it was a good article by CNN. You can find it online if you want more detail. We always had an Advent wreath in our home. Oh. And when I was a member of a church in Mission Viejo, we had an Advent log making party. And people did donate the logs and we brought in the drills and gave out the candles and everything. So wow, nice. It's a fun, a That's fun activity for everybody, you know, yeah. meaningful. <clears throat> Well, let's launch into 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Thank you for sharing those comments. Thank, now, thank you for the uh, sharing. Yeah. yeah, I liked it. So we've moved on from chapters 1 and 2 into 1 Corinthians 3. As we get into 3, and it's already been happening, but as we get into 3, you'll see that Paul's sure. using really familial language for the people in the congregation. He talks a lot about brothers and sisters as he refers to them. He wants to remind the congregation there at Corinth that they're all brothers and sisters in Christ. They're all children of God. But he reminds them that they are still people of the flesh, that while they want to see themselves as very spiritual, and that's what they aspire to be, the people in Corinth are still wrestling with a lot of very worldly problems, which are kind of weighing them down. He talks about leaders. He's already gotten into that part with the with the arguments over who we follow. But now as he gets into chapter three, he's going to talk specifically more about the leaders. He says that some come along and they plant the crop and some come along and they water the crop and some are harvesting the crop, but all are actually serving simply in God's place and they will be held accountable by God. Then he really speaks to the people and says in chapter three, you now are the temple of God, baptized together as one family in Jesus Christ through word and sacrament. You now, he keeps using you, and the you is, it's the plural there, the y'all form, as we might say. All of you together now are the temple of Christ. Your bodies are the temple of Christ. He talks about the leaders, as I said, one plants, another waters, building this up all to God's glory, who is the person who's really doing all the work. Chapter 3 kind of reminds us from a Lutheran perspective, perspective of Luther's saying, simul justus et peccator, in Latin, or some, same time saint, same time sinner, that we are in Christ, we are saved, we have been brought into the family of God, and yet still our worldly baggage is hanging on to us. And so Luther says we're one and the same, waiting that day on the other side when we will be simply saint, but for now we are same time saint, same time sinner, waiting to be healed. And so he talks about, Paul's going to talk about needing to get on to more spiritual things and deeper spiritual things as we still have the old person clinging to us. Okay, that kind of serves as an introduction to chapter 3. Carolyn, would you read verse 1? But I, brethren, could not address you as spiritual men, but as men of the flesh, as babes in Christ. So here he says I, he really would like to be referring to them totally spiritually, but I address you as worldly. Or do you have any other words for the translation there? Carnal. Flesh. Carnal. People Carnal. of the flesh. People, People of the of flesh. flesh. In, Sensual. What was that? Sensual. Sensual. Oh, interesting. Okay. The word is sarkanois, which sarks is flesh. That's where it comes from. It's the meat. The Latin translation is carneus, which is meat from which we get carnal. Carnal and carnivore. A carnivore is a meat eater. Carnivore. Yeah. But it, it means the way he's using it here is worldly. I want to address you as truly spiritual, but you're still stuck in this flesh. You're still living in this flesh. You're still stuck in all this. You're still just babes in the faith. He's asking them to grow on and go further. But at this point, he's just kind of starting to, to prod them along a little bit. Dalton, verse 2, please. I fed you on milk instead of solid food for which you were not yet ready. Indeed, you were still not ready for it. Your infants still in Christ, your infants still in your faith, and therefore I had to give you spiritual milk, not, and Dalton said solid food. Do you have other translations? Solid food. Solid foods. Okay. It can be translated as meat. That's actually the more literal. I had to give you I had to give you a, 
think of, I had to give you Gerber's instead of a piece of steak, basically, would be the picture here. Yeah, mine's meat. Meat, yeah. yeah. Uh, by meat, it means he's using it as solid food, but he really does literally say meat here. It's, I couldn't give you what I would feed an adult. I could only give you what we would feed to an infant because why? They weren't ready for it. They're still ready. aren't ready. You still aren't ready. You're still not at that point in your spiritual journey. Verse 3, Pam, please. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Here he's really doing a little chastisement, a little uh, a little bit of a kick, you might say. He's reminding them, this builds on what we read. Remember this divisiveness that's going on as the people find their different factions. You're still worldly, or you're still carnal. You're still living in this fleshly state, filled with all kinds of jealousy and quarreling, or jealousy and strife, or what other translations might you have? Jealousy and wrangling. Jealousy and wrangling, okay. The word for jealousy here is zealous, or zealous. It literally means to boil. Zealous is to boil. Why do you think we get jealousy from that? <laughs> Boiling man. <laughs> Boiling man. <laughs> These are all, it all comes from it. Now, really, the word is the word for zeal, and zeal isn't necessary, it's necessarily always bad, right? I mean, it's sometimes good to be zealous for the truth, What there are things. But he's using it here is this, uh, in the unflattering sense, we might say here, that you're boiling over with these petty things between one another, jealousy over one another, and striving with one another. Wrangling often follows jealousy, does it not? When you're jealous, then it kind of brings out the arguments type thing. Uh, we might say jealousy brings out the worst in nature or worst in us. What's the the little green monster comes out, right? Jealousy, yeah. the <laughs> little green monster tends to lead to things. That's what he's saying here. You haven't become spiritually mature. You haven't fully grown up. You're still quarreling like children. You're allowing these divisions to distract you, and these divisions mean nothing. And here he goes back to the divisions to flesh that out, flesh it a different way. Verse 4, Dennis, please. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? Just mere human creatures. This is mankind. If you're saying that I'm joining this faction or that faction, does that sound like you're being spiritual? Who is the one and only faction you should be following? Jesus. Jesus, right. So if you're wrapped up in I'm following this guy or I'm following that guy, you're still wrapped up in the flesh. You're still acting like worldly people. Your eye is not where it should be. Verse 5, Diane, please. What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. Goes, what are we? What am I? I'm nothing. I'm, we're just servants through who you came to believe. Do you have other translations than servants? Uh, God's agents. Oh, that's interesting. This is your new English? God's agents. God's agents. Oh, interesting. Uh, it's, the word here is diaconia. Uh, it's deacon, your servant, minister. It could be translated, minister. But think of... Okay, good. Think of how it's used. When we think of today in the church, there's kind of the bishops, pastors, deacons, but that's not fleshed out at this point. That's something that kind of happens along the way. At this point, things are more used neutrally, uh, less specifically, but nonetheless, already in Acts, we did kind of see this. We have the apostles and we have the deacons, the deacons who are doing we often describe it as ministers of word and sacrament, ministers of word and service. Deacons, who were the original deacons? What do we hear in Acts? Stephen. 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 Mm -hmm. <coughs> what were they supposed to do? Serve, Serve. the community of the truth. 
they were going to care for the orphans and the widows yes. because the apostles just didn't have time to do all that kind of work. It literally says, it kind of says they're waiting on tables. They're, think of somebody waiting on tables, taking care of people. What are Apollos and Paul? We're just table waiters. We're, that's the word here. We're not people in charge. We're not running the store. We're not running the restaurant. We're not the chef. We're the waiters. But through us, you came to believe as the Lord gave us our tasks. God gives everyone different tasks in the church, and that was our task. And so Paul then goes more elaborately into that. Judy with verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And here he kind of lays it out. Okay, I came and I started the church. I planted the church. Apollos then came along and he preached to you. He shared the word with you more. He watered. But who's responsible for making it grow? God. God. Only God. Right. God's the one who actually does it all in the end. Verse 7, Terry, please. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. Here, it, neither one is anything. Neither one has room for pride. Neither one has room for self-satisfaction. This is, this is Paulos or Paul, but it applies to all leaders in the church. There's no reason for pride or self-satisfaction. Never should a minister in any way be idolized or put too high on a pedestal. There's no reason to be splitting over, I want him or I want her or any of that. It's love the person, care for the leader, respect the call and the task, but only Jesus is the founder of the faith. Jesus is the one who our faith is in. Jesus is the one who's important. Doesn't matter who planted, who watered, only God can make things grow. It's the power of the word, God working through the word. The minister who plants is nothing. The minister who waters is nothing. God gives the increase. God is the all in all. Gene, verse 8, please. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. They're working of what they've been given to, the sower, the one who waters. They're doing the same work that God has given them to do called by the same Lord to do this, and they are responsible to God for that with which they have been entrusted. Verse 9, Mike, please. We are fellow workers with God. You are God's farm, God's building. God's farm, okay. So we're God's fellow workers. We're working together with God. Do you have anything else, uh, any other translations? God's field. God's field is going to come up. Mm -hmm. God's husbandry. God's husbandry. Very much mm -hmm. King James there. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Old English. Mm -hmm. God's fellow workers would be synergoi. Synergoi, from which we get synergy. 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 Right. It's this bringing together. The minister works with God. God gives the minister power to work with God, to bring these things to happen in God's field, God's husbandry. The word is Georgian. I think that's probably the source of the word Georgia. Georgia was tilled land. That's literally what it means. It's the tilled land. You are God's tilled land. What's the difference between tilled land and untilled land? Growth. Makes things grow. Makes Allows things grow. Things to grow. Things are ready to grow, right? So picture that. God's field is a new international. That's what I have here too. It doesn't really bring that out so much as think of the tilled earth. This is the earth that's that's ready for growth. You are God's fellow workers. You are God's field ready for growth. You are God's building. And the word there is oikdome, which is a compound word meaning this building of God. It's similar to the word that we use for, that uh, the New Testament uses for the church, this household of God, this building of God. God is the one who is using these things, and he's going to pick up on that theme in a minute. God's work involves many different individuals with a variety of gifts and a variety of abilities. There aren't supposed to be any superstars in the team. It's all supposed to be team members working together. No I in team. Remember that one? We can, 
we can become useful members of God's team by setting aside that human desire for glory to do what we're supposed to do. Don't seek the praise that comes from people in comparison to praise from God. Praise from people isn't what's important. This is a laborer who is doing this. We are to be laboring, fellow workers with God. It does mean that you're supposed to be working. We're all supposed to be working for the harvest at the end of time. Uh, are we at Mike for 10? Uh, probably Carol. Carol. I did nine. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Carol, 10. <laughs> okay, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Okay. God's grace is what's doing all this, Paul says. I laid a foundation as a master builder, or do you have other translations? Architect. Skilled master builder. Architect, uh, architect is actually the, the root of the word. It's architecton. Uh, tecton is what the New Testament, the Gospels use for Jesus and Joseph, meaned hand worker. This is the architecton, the person who's over all of that, and that's where we get our word architect from, the person who designs all of this. I laid the foundation as this master builder, this, this great plan, but then somebody else built on it. Each one should be careful examining how we're doing this building that we're working together. The architect has to lay carefully the foundations of the building, or we might use it today as the architect has to really meet code and draw up all of the engineering diagrams and specifics so it doesn't collapse. All of that's important. Think of the great cathedrals you've seen pictures of in Europe. Those things took often well over 100 years to build. It'd be generation after generation. The people who planned all that died, but then they kept doing it. The National Cathedral in Washington is another example. That took, what was 150 years to complete or something, the National Cathedral in Washington? The people who planned all that were long dead, but they laid the foundation so that others could continue to build upon it. That's kind of this image that Paul is using. But what Paul wants to make clear in that is, even though he's being used as the chief architect, it's not him. It's the grace of God, because the church ultimately isn't a building. The church is the people. And God is drawing the people together. Yes, every church has a founder. For St. Matthew's, it was Lauren Lundblad in 1947. But he was doing what he was called to do. And people after that did what they were called to do. And it's always God that's working through all of it. Pastor, just a quick question. The, the ark, of course, is the top. The tecton, you said, was a foundation? Uh, no, no, no. The tecton is the hand worker. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, I was, trying, I was trying to relate to see if it related to our tectonic plates as a foundation. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll look that up. Yeah. But your <laughs> translation <laughs> had the architect. It's architecton. Yeah, yeah. yeah, architecton. So that's the yeah. master builder or the master, the chief architect, kind of. But it's a compound word of that chief hand worker, as in essence. So tecton was used at times for carpenter. That's where the tradition about Jesus coming, uh, Jesus as a carpenter comes from. It's not really what it says, but it kind of grows out of that because it could be used for a carpenter. Or it can be used for a mason, but literally the word means hand worker, or we would probably say today day laborer. Yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's close in prayer. As a people waiting for the Lord, let us offer our prayers to our loving God. We pray that the church will be alert, ready to receive the Lord when he comes with joy. Let us pray to God. God, receive our prayer. We pray that those who live in the darkness of fear and despair may experience the dawning brightness of hope. Let us pray to God, God, uh, receive our prayer. prayer. We pray that those oppressed by injustice may be freed by the efforts of concerned believers everywhere. Let us pray to God, God, uh, receive our prayer. prayer. We pray that St. Matthew's Church will teach by example the ways of the good news of Jesus. Let us pray to God, 
God, God receive our, our prayer. prayer. And let us pray that those who are hurting may go up to the mountain of the Lord to enjoy peace and rest. Let us pray to God. God, God receive our prayer. prayer. God of all nations, hear us. May this season prepare us to celebrate the coming of your Son, Jesus, among us. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us. I see uh, Marv has just signed on, but we actually had the council meeting between services, Marv. But maybe, <laughs> maybe you can give us a little update. How is Pat doing? Or maybe Pat's there with you. You're muted, Pat. I mean, Marv. <laughs> right. Now we can hear you. Okay. How now is she, Pat? She's coughing a lot right now. And what's that? So anyway, um, she's not feeling the best. Let's put it that way. Oh, she's definitely in our prayers. This and with this morning, I almost texted you and said, "Please don't come to church. You probably don't need to be around a whole bunch of people." But I figured you probably knew that instinctively. So, <laughs> yeah. So here I am. Well, we had our council <laughs> meeting. Just a couple little items. So, yeah. so was the meeting successful? Yeah, we're just uh, talking about two different bids on the tower. So. Got to get some more information. Okay. All right. Well, so wait, wait for an email from Pastor. He'll have a hot and heavy one this week, probably. That's it. Okay. As <laughs> right. well, long as it's not too hot or too heavy, <laughs> uh, I'd probably be able to handle it. We have two bids now. That's good news. So yeah. That's more than we've had. That's good. Yeah. 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 That's very good. Yeah. All well, right, Marv, everyone. Terry, Terry's homesick, too. Terry, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> our prayers with Terry yeah, well, and Pat as they hopefully get treatment and move forward. Yeah, yeah well, we'll uh, got a doctor's appointment tomorrow, so <laughs> okay. see how things are. All right. Good. You hang in there too, Marv. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah, Amen. Marv. Yeah, I'm trying not to catch it, so. Yeah, don't. <laughs> you don't need that. Not good. Really? Okay, well. Um, I'll wait for the minutes 